The Federal Reserve just lit a repo market time bomb. Will it blow up in 2022? I'm going to explain this to you in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the process of quantitative tightening and the mechanics behind the repo market. I want to point out that the Fed minutes just came out about a week ago and the market absolutely tanked. Why is this? Because we all know the Fed has been talking about tapering. That's when they just reduce the size of quantitative easing from, let's say, 120 billion down to 70 billion, down to 50 billion, down to zero. We also know that they've been talking about raising interest rates in 2022. But where the market was really caught off sides is the Fed is now actually talking about quantitative tightening. This is when they're reducing the size of their balance sheet. Quantitative easing is when they're buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities, increasing the size of their balance sheet. Quantitative tightening is when they are selling those mortgage-backed securities or treasuries. So let's think this through here to see if quantitative easing or raising interest rates could lead to another repo market blow up like we saw in September of 2019. The first thing I want to point out for today's video, we're going to focus on the balance sheet of the commercial banking system and the repo market quantitative easing increasing interest rates. So it doesn't matter whether or not the transaction is with a banking entity or with a non-banking entity. So let's go over to the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve and the banks. We'll just call this bank number one. It represents an aggregate total of the commercial banking system that the Fed usually does business with. So the Fed has treasuries on the asset side of their balance sheet and bank reserves nominated in dollars. These bank reserves are assets of the commercial banking system. And these bank reserves are one of the main things they use to back up the loans they are creating in the repo market or the cash they're providing, the liquidity they're providing to all those other financial entities. So what happens when the Fed sells one of their treasuries to a bank? Well, again, this bank has an account with the Fed and those bank reserves nominated in dollars are a liability of the Fed. So if this treasury goes onto the balance sheet of the bank, which is represented here, how do they pay for the treasury? Well, let's just say they buy $100 worth of treasuries and they add $100 worth of bank reserves that were liabilities of the Fed. The Fed would simply decrease their account balance from 100 down to zero. So at the end of the transaction, the Fed would no longer have that treasury as an asset on their balance sheet, but they'd no longer have the bank reserves, the liability would be gone as well. And then the bank would actually trade the bank reserves they had as assets for the treasury they just purchased from the Federal Reserve. So you'll notice a couple things from this simple example of what happens during the quantitative tightening process. Number one, Fed's balance sheet decrease, smaller in size. Number two, the banks have fewer bank reserves denominated in dollars, therefore their balance sheet capacity or their ability to create loans in the repo market has decreased. Now I want to be very clear, just because a bank doesn't have any bank reserves doesn't mean that they can't lend in repo, but that gets very, very technical and complex. For the sake of keeping things simple in this video, we're going to focus on the bank reserves. So if a bank has fewer bank reserves, again, that reduces their capacity or the amount of loans that they can create in the repo market. So now let's go over an example of how repo works, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I'm actually going to use this example throughout the video because I think this makes things very clear when we go over Joseph Wang's view. And he is a good friend of mine that used to work at the Federal Reserve. And another one of my good friends, Jeff Snyder, who has a little bit different view on the problems of quantitative tightening. So we start with the average Joe. 
Let's say the average Joe has $1,000 in cash. And he is good buddies with Moody the Millennial. <laughs> Everybody's favorite with their blue hair. So Moody started a little side hustle, a business. Let's say they started a coffee shop and they have a lot of accounts receivable, which you really wouldn't have in a coffee shop, but let's just say that this coffee shop does. <laughs> so there are a lot of clients that owe uh, Moody money. It's tough to get those pronouns correct. So Moody has payroll coming up of let's say $1,000, but they can't meet that payroll obligation because their clients, or yeah, their clients <laughs> haven't paid them. So Moody does have a Prius. So Moody goes to their buddy Joe and says, hey Joe, I really need $1,000 to make payroll and I've got my Prius and I can give you that as collateral. So Joe says, okay, well that Prius is probably worth a thousand bucks. So they go ahead and trade and they agree that in two weeks, they're just going to swap back. So the first transaction is Joe gets the Prius, Moody gets the thousand bucks. Two weeks later, Moody gives Joe back a thousand bucks plus a little for interest. So let's say that Moody gives Joe back $1,010 and then Joe gives Moody their Prius back and we're all good. Joe provided the liquidity that Moody the millennial needed to make their payroll for their coffee shop. So the main takeaway you need to remember for the rest of the video is we really have two components that we've got to get hyper-focused on. Number one is the cash or Joe's ability to lend into the repo market. And then we have the collateral, which gives Moody the ability to borrow in the repo market from a counterparty like Joe. And although this sounds very basic, this is gonna illustrate throughout the rest of the video how the Fed has just lit a repo market time bomb and how it may explode in 2022. Step number two. Now let's go back and look at the repo blow up 1.0 going back to September, 2019. Let's do this from the vantage point of Joseph Wang. And if you don't know Joseph, he used to work at the New York Fed's trading desk, meaning he was the person that was actually in charge of doing quantitative tightening and quantitative easing for the Federal Reserve. So we have to start by going down to this chart, and this is the Fed's balance sheet, or BS, whatever you prefer. <laughs> it goes back prior to 2018 all the way to today's date. On the left, we go from $3 trillion up to $9 trillion. So prior to 2018, the Fed's balance sheet was about $4.5, $4.7 trillion from the three rounds of quantitative easing they did starting in 2008-2009. But then in 2018, they started the process of quantitative tightening that we talked about in step number one. This is when they're actually selling treasuries and mortgage-backed securities instead of buying them, reducing the size of their balance sheet. So it goes all the way down until we get to September 2019, and then you see it starts to reverse course dramatically, and then it really reverses course when we get to the Cervasa sickness, <laughs> but we don't want to go that far yet. So now let's check out a chart of repo rates, same timeline. On the left, we go from 0% up to 8%, and as the Fed was raising rates and reducing the size of their balance sheet, the interest rates in repo going up slightly. Now this Initial spike was back in 2018, so nowhere near as dramatic as what we saw in September of 2019, but definitely was a repo spike. And this happens occasionally for a variety of reasons, but a lot of times at the end of a quarter, all the banks will have liquidity needs or they need to shore up their balance sheet with more cash due to a variety of regulations such as 
Basel III. So there's kind of a cash crunch right at the end of the third quarter, or maybe the fourth quarter. We saw this in 2018, and then of course we saw this in September 2019 as well. The big difference, according to Joseph Wang, is that we had this perfect storm in 2019 because it was an end of quarter, but also because the Fed was reducing the size of their balance sheet, there were fewer bank reserves that the commercial banks had on their balance sheet and therefore a reduced capacity to lend the cash or the liquidity into the repo market to meet the needs of the counterparties during this cash crunch at the end of Q3 or Q4. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, starts off the Fed doing quantitative tightening in 2018. This reduces the amount of bank reserves, therefore reduces the balance sheet capacity for the repo market, giving that liquidity the counterparties need. In 2019, at the end of Q3, we saw this perfect storm where all of the financial entities in repo, or a lot of them, needed more cash and they needed it quickly. But there was a lot less cash to lend into repo market or a lot less balance sheet capacity is the way I like to look at it. And therefore, you saw this huge spike in rates, which would imply that the demand for the cash is increasing, but the supply has gone down. And again, I want to be clear, this is Joseph Wang's view. In step number three, we're going to go over Jeff Snyder's view of what happened during repo, and it's completely different. But I want to give you all angles so you can determine what the probabilities are that we have a repo blow up going into 2022. Now, I know a lot of you right now are probably sitting back watching this video and saying, okay, George, I get it, this repo blow up and time bomb, and you're using all this hyperbolic language, but what's the big deal? I mean, who cares if the repo market spikes up to 10%? It really doesn't affect me buying groceries tomorrow when I go to the supermarket, or it doesn't affect my kid going to school, or it doesn't affect my job. It's just something esoteric that happens in the financial markets. But unfortunately, you would be whistling right by the graveyard. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, editor, let's cut to the internet. Okay, let's go to this article from CNBC, and it's called, The Fed's Fix of the Crucial Repo Lending Market for Banks Will Be Put to the Test on Monday. And this goes back to Friday, September 27th, 2019. During the temporary panic in the overnight funds market, rates spiked to as high as 10%, and the Fed's own benchmark Fed funds rate briefly traded at 2.30%, five basis points above the Fed's target range on September 17th. So that might not sound like a big deal, but let's think that through. If the repo rates go to 10%, this is the market that provides dollar liquidity, often for financial institutions across the globe. So if you could get a 10% rate trading in repo, well, why would you lend dollars in any other market? So what happens is all of the interest rates for dollar funding across the entire globe levitate up to that 10% mark until there's enough liquidity to bring the interest rates back down to an equilibrium point. But that equilibrium point would be way, way higher <laughs> than the Fed's funds rate at 2.3%. I know it's zero to 25 basis points now, but we got to go back to 2019. And this was where the rate was back then. So in plain English, if repo would have gone up to 10% and let's say stayed at around eight or 7% when there were more dollar lenders coming in to take advantage of that high rate, your mortgage rates, if you're buying a new home as an example, would have gone from maybe three or 4% up to 10 or 12 percent. Your auto loans would have gone completely 
parabolic. Your credit card loans, the adjustable rate on your credit cards, those interest rates would have gone through the roof. Every single interest rate, the price of money across the globe and the United States would have gone up by three, four, maybe even five times. Let's not forget that interest rates are the price of money. And money, or dollars, is one half of every single transaction. So if the price of money goes up, what would most likely happen to the price of stuff? We could see that go up even further than it has in 2020 and 2021. But the price of assets would not go up. That's way different. So their prices would not just go down, but they would absolutely collapse. And we haven't even gotten to the point where the Fed has lost control over the overnight rate. Going back to that reading, it pointed out the Fed's target rate was, I think, 2% to 2.25%. And because of the repo spike momentarily, the Fed's rate, overnight rate, that they're supposed to have total control over went up by five basis points, or it exceeded the range by five basis points. So not only would we have disaster throughout the economy because the interest rates were going from, let's say, 2.33% up to 8 9 10%, but also if the market sees the Fed losing control over the one thing that they are supposed to have total control over, the confidence, the shell game that the Fed and the central planners have been playing for the last three or four decades collapses. And this would not only take down the U.S. economy, it would take down the global economy. Now that we understand the repo market and repo rates are basically the linchpin that prevents the whole house of cards from crashing down, Let's make sure we're all on the same page, going back to our very simple example. Average Joe, Moody the Millennial. This time, the average Joe has $2,000 that he can lend into the repo market. Well, that's his balance sheet capacity. Let's use that term, a little more accurate. Our counterparties are Moody the Millennial. They still need $1,000 for payroll, and they still have the Prius as collateral. But there's another counterparty. It's not Moody the Millennial. Oh no. It is Moody's hypochondriac cousin, Maskey the Millennial. So Maskey has a side hustle as well. They have a payroll or payroll needs of $1,000. And let's say they own a bike shop. So Maskey has a lot of accounts receivable, just like Moody but they don't have the liquidity they need. They don't have the dollars they need because they're not gonna get paid from their clients until, let's say, next Tuesday. So Maskey and Moody both need $1,000 from the repo market to cover payroll. But here's the problem. Since the Fed has been doing quantitative tightening, it's been reducing the balance sheet capacity for the average Joe to lend the dollars into repo. So although the average Joe started with $2,000, let's say back in 2018, when the Fed started doing quantitative tightening, now they only have $1,000. So if Joe was lending out the $2,000, let's say at a 2% interest rate, what would happen to the interest rate now that he only has $1,000? It's simple supply and demand. The price of the $1,000 would go through the roof. Why? Because Moody would need it, and therefore, they'd go to Joe and say, Joe, I'm willing to pay you 3%. And then Maskey would come in and say, well, I'm willing to pay you 4%. And then to go back to Moody, I'm willing to pay you 7%. Maskey, I'm willing to pay you 10%. And this is basically what happened in the repo market in 2019, and it's something we could see happen again in the repo market in 2022 if or when the Fed starts another round of quantitative tightening. Step number three, 
Now let's go over Jeff Snyder's view of the repo blow up 1.0. In step number two, we talked about how Joseph Wang thought it was a lack of bank reserves in the system created by the process of quantitative tightening, among other things, end of quarter, and some regulation. But the problem in his eyes really revolves around the amount of bank reserves or liquidity in the system, the balance sheet capacity of the counterparties that lend into the repo market. The bottom line is there just isn't enough cash in the system. But Jeff Snyder sees it from a completely opposite angle, meaning that he doesn't think the issue was the amount of cash in the system. It was really the amount of collateral or acceptable collateral. Jeff Snyder calls this pristine collateral. And this is what the counterparties who are lending into the repo market want to back up the overnight loan or the term repo if it's two weeks, 30 days, what have you. So let's think through how this works. If we have counterparties with cash and counterparties with collateral that want the cash, if the counterparties with cash look at whatever it is, let's say in this case, it's Moody's Prius, and they say, eh, yeah, you know, that Prius, we really don't want that collateral anymore. It's not pristine. It doesn't look good. And we think you have a little bit too much risk with your balance sheet. So therefore, we'll go ahead and lend to you. But because that collateral isn't optimal, we're going to increase the interest rate we're charging you. You can think of this as a risk premium. So if they think the collateral or the borrowing entity is more risky, they're going to raise the interest rate from let's say 2.3% on up to 10%. And this could have been what we saw in September 2019 when the repo market blew up the last time and we had this huge spike in interest rates. And again, just to be very clear, Jeff Snyder's view is this was caused by a lack of good acceptable collateral in the repo market. It was not caused by a lack of cash. Now for a moment, let's go back to step number one and remember what the Fed is planning on doing in 2022. Number one, they're gonna taper, reduce the amount of quantitative easing down to zero. Number two, they're going to raise interest rates. And number three, they're gonna do quantitative tightening, which is reducing the size of their balance sheet by selling assets like treasuries and mortgage-backed securities into the market, reducing the amount of bank reserves that the big banks have on their balance sheet. But let's think through what happens if the Fed raises interest rates to the amount of collateral that's in the system available for repo transactions. We'll start off with an example of a one-year treasury. And let's just assume that you bought this for $100 and it had a 5% interest rate or yield. So let's say the Fed comes in and increases interest rates to 10% for the sake of this example. Well, now the market participants have a choice. They could buy a treasury issued by the Fed or treasury that's on the secondary market for $100 that's producing a 10% yield, or they could buy your treasury for $100 that's producing a 5% yield. Well, wait a minute. Why on earth would anyone buy a treasury that was yielding 5% when for the same price, they could buy a treasury that was yielding 10%? The answer is they wouldn't. So what you would have to do if you wanted to sell your treasury, let's say at the six month mark prior to maturity, is you would have to lower your price. Well, if you have to lower your price, what would that mean for the amount of collateral that you have available for the repo market? Let's go back over to our very simple example. Average Joe has $2,000. Moody has this Prius that was 
worth a thousand dollars, and Maskey has the bike that was worth a thousand dollars if interest rates are five percent. Now, when interest rates go up, the price or the value of their collateral goes down. So now let's assume the price for the Prius on the open market is $500. And the price or the value of the bike is $500, but they still need $1,000 to cover their payroll. Well, Joe has enough money to give both of them because he has $2,000, a thousand for each. But now all of a sudden, the value of their collateral has decreased because interest rates have gone up. This effectively creates a collateral shortage, just like Jeff Snyder talks about going back to 2019 in September. So to get the liquidity they need to cover payroll, they would have one of two options. Either they need to offer up two Prius, or pre-I <laughs> for collateral, two bikes for collateral, or Joe needs to increase the interest rate because of the increase of risk because the value of that collateral isn't what it was prior to the Fed raising interest rates, maybe in 2022. So the bottom line here is regardless of whether you're on Joseph Wang's side, where you see the repo blow up in 2019 being a result of a lack of cash, or if you're on Jeff Snyder's side and you see the repo blow up being a result of a lack of collateral moving into 2022, because the Fed is talking about raising interest rates and doing quantitative tightening, the Fed will be reducing the amount of cash and most likely reducing the amount of collateral. So what I'm saying is regardless of who you agree with, who's right or who's wrong, the Fed is going to be increasing the probabilities of us seeing a repo blow up 2.0 moving in to 2022. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here and I will see you on the next video.